Hey, good morning, Thinker. Sorry for a little bit of delay. I'm trying to figure out uh, a couple things, uh, how to really monitor the stream on my phone. Yeah, I had to mute my phone, which is interesting. Okay. So I changed up my setup a little bit. Hey, Ulan is here. Ulan Taiai. Tide? I'm sorry for butchering your name. But thank you for showing up. I appreciate it. I changed up my setup a little bit. Um, what's nice is now I have my phone next to me so I can monitor the stream. And instead of standing, I'm, I'm actually sitting. I prefer sitting. Ula. My name is Ula. Awesome. Welcome, Ula. I, lo I like the fox um, avatar you have. Very nice. Okay, so one thing I'm going to do is move my canvas just a little bit. So it's facing me a little bit more. Hopefully that didn't get too dark. There you go. And then focus. Yeah, I'm sitting here right next to the camera too. Hopefully you can hear me. I can see everything. I think you can see everything. I can watch the chat. Okay, this is working well. Yesterday we got the initial drawing uh, going for the tiger, which went pretty fast, honestly. I'm happy with how far I've gotten on this. Um, but now that I look at it, I see that <laughs> I have some issues. Something about when I was standing that it's, for me, it's hard to judge things because I'm, maybe because I'm moving around a bit too much. Not sure, but anyway. I'm going to decrease the size of uh, this jowl here, I guess, part of the muzzle, the right side of the muzzle. Actually, it needs to be decreased pretty far, like way in there. Let me get my eraser out. So usually I work in charcoal. Finland, awesome. And thinkers in Connecticut. That's fantastic. All over the world. Usually I use graphite, but yesterday, well, in, in the standing position that I was in, I was getting nothing but glare, but now that I'm sitting, I don't get any glare. Uh, but I think uh, on the stream, you guys can see the charcoal a lot better. So we're gonna stay with the charcoal. And it's nice, I can actually see my drawing come alive as well so the reason why I decrease this is because I'm looking at my square and this side of the tiger's face is like a quarter of that square rather than as far out as I had it yesterday I'm not going to do, I'm trying not to do too much correction on this initial drawing because it's better done after we check our drawing digitally. And I, I keep hinting upon that. You know, one thing I haven't figured out. With, with the oil painting here, I don't have any resources to download. <laughs> um, so I'm not sure 
how much uh, the Gumroad resources are going to be worth. I mean, they're definitely worth a lot with all the digital work that we did to, to get this tiger up to where it is digitally. But I need to figure out what I'm going to do. traditionally or if I just stop the the gum road thing just for the digital resources that would be easier so all I'm doing it's gonna be uh, a long repeat of this it reminds me of what Craig Mullen says because he, you know, he's a really amazing artist, digital artist. Been doing it since before there was a Photoshop, or at the beginning of Photoshop, really. And uh, he says, basically, you know, all art is, when you get down into the details, is a rigorous application of the fundamentals. Just on a smaller level. And so this is what I'm doing. Just a rigorous application of the fundamentals. Looking at the drawing, uh, comparing it with my iPad, which is actually to my right. I usually, I like setting up everything to my left because I'm a, a right-handed individual. And if you set up your reference to your right, you have to look over your arm. Oh, Ulan says, usually I am working uh, at this time of the day, but this week on winter vacation, so can join live. Oh, fantastic. Happy winter vac vacation. I, I bet you there's a lot of snow in Finland. Well, that's my guess. I have no idea about Finland. What's the weather like in Finland? Lots of snow right now? Is it really cold? Probably like, what, negative five Celsius or something? Okay, that's a white area. Now, the difficult part in this drawing is going to be constantly referencing where these stripes are and putting them down. When you get into so much detail like this, um, man, it's, uh, you get lost in it. This reminds me of something that Richard Schmidt said in his book, uh, Alla Prima. Some snow today, not cold, around zero Celsius, but we'll be getting colder again. Oh, okay, 32. So you're right at frizzy, freezing, yeah. Not too bad. I think when we were in the 20s uh, where I'm at, I'm in around, well, Tacoma, Seattle, south of Seattle. But Richard Schmidt had said that, because uh, he was talking about generalization of forms. There's a lot of things you can generalize and still make it look uh, somewhat accurate. But at the end of the day, you know, like the stripes on a zebra, you really have to kind of, you can't generalize that into just a gray. <laughs> you have to paint the stripes on the zebra. See, and there's a, just a confusion of lines here. Um, here's the problem you can run into, especially when you're using um, charcoal, is you can make a mess really, really quickly, especially when you don't, if you don't get things right and it doesn't erase too well, you have to be careful not to make a mess. Um, even, you know, this part that I erased somewhat. Now we have this really thick edge. 
and it's a bit inaccurate. You don't, you're not really sure which is the correct line to deal with. I think that'll be okay. Let me look and see. Okay. My... Okay, I can't change what shows. I'm trying to find the upward and bottom bounds of what's visually you can see on my camera so I don't go beyond that and continue working. Okay, so you you can see just up here, not at the very top, and well, you can see all the way to the right of the canvas. It gets kind of dark over here. Let me turn on this other light. Yeah, see, there's a lot of, you see the glare there? This is a problem with oil painting always, is you always get some kind of glare on there. Oh yeah, thanks, thanks for the advert, uh, Thinker, I appreciate that. Yeah, check out the, the design process downloads. 27 degrees here. He's got about four inches of snow last night. Wow. <laughs> Connecticut winds. Okay. So what I can do here, because right at this spot is where our palm frond comes in. I'm going for maximum accuracy here as much as I can get so that I don't have to redo as much when we check our drawing. And the less redo I do, the easier this is, and the least amount of charcoal mess that I have to figure out is on my canvas. Oh, shoveling snow. It is good exercise though. Just as long as you don't overdo it and hurt your back. Shoveling snow, yeah. Okay, I need to make sure that I'm on the right angle. too low there, but that's okay. I, I can easily bring my canvas up in a moment. I can't hear the music right now. It's, a, it's really quiet for me. <laughs> Usually I have my headphones on because I'm right next to the computer, but not all the way over here. I have my setup on, not the other side of it, well, yeah, pretty far away from my computer so that I can keep it up all the time because I work on my computer throughout the day. One of the things that uh, I tend to run into that I repeat uh, over and over again as far as my drawing is concerned is I tend to make things larger um, than what they are. So I look at them and I draw them as I see them, but they grow in size with my drawing. And I know, I only know this tendency because, um, I have, you know, checked my drawing and rechecked my drawing, you know, through a multitude of paintings and recognize that tendency which is really important. I mean, it's not a bad tendency. I mean, you can have all kinds of 
tendencies to, you know, um, drawing inaccurately, but if you're consistent with it and you know about it, you can improve pretty, pretty rapidly just by having that understanding. Okay, down to business. Chris, when using your non-toxic way of painting, how do you practice fat over lean? <laughs> I just did a video on that. Uh, I'm not going to point you to it. That's okay. And it's a question that I've gotten a uh, multitude of times. It's a really good question. A lot of people ask that. They're worried about it. Let me take a drink of tea and I'll answer you. So, so one thing I, I did a bunch of research on this because um, I wanted to get it right for people. It's a question that actually it's, it's, it's something that a lot of people avoid because, oh, they're just, you know, I need this rule. I'll use solvents and just deal with it. You know, open a window. Don't worry about my health. It doesn't hurt me right now. You know, all that kind of crap. Uh, so they're not dealing with it. So I wanted to deal with it. I wanted to really look at the research on it. And what's great, about, I have this book. Um, it's called Traditional Oil Painting. Uh, I, I have it on the shelf. I'd have to look at the author. But what's really nice is this author goes through all these beginning ways of painting you know like from flemish to dutch to everything like and goes through the whole entire processes hey el morris is here welcome el morris i'm answering uh thinker's question about uh non-toxic painting and fat over lean uh one of your stream that you won some kind of competition oh yeah i'll talk about that later uh give me a moment and I did more research on that. And so what's interesting is when oil painting began back in 13 or 1400, something like that, it was forever ago, or 1500s, <clears throat> I can't remember. Um, I, I feature uh, one of these, one of amazing paintings that you learn in art history in that uh, video that I did about this. And come to find out, when oil painting started, they didn't have solvents. And there's this beautiful painting that was done over 500 years ago that never used solvents and is completely sound today. It has cracking on it, but for a 500 year old painting, some of these little tiny cracks, I mean, that's par for the course. Um, and that really convinced me. I was like, okay, if they could make a painting that lasts for 500 years without any solvents back in the day, there you go. You know, well, we can do it as well. I think they had, they did have some kind of um, alcohol or something that they would use, maybe. Uh, I, can't, I can't remember the exact research on that. But anyway, my point is that it is possible. And that's the main thing that I wanted to see. Okay, is this possible? And um, I need to raise up my canvas. So let me pause here. Okay. Now we have all kinds of room to draw more stuff. Tiger body. So the, for fat over lean, many artists just focus on both ends of the spectrum, lean paint and fat paint. Lean paint is paint that is mostly solvent, very thin, you know, a thin wash at the beginning. Lots of teachers uh, still teach. You have to put down a thin wash at the beginning or you draw with uh, paint that has been thinned out, usually a burnt umber. 
and burnt umber is important. Uh, I, I won't go into the reason why that's important. So that's what we usually think about. And then on the, uh, the, f the fat side of paint, it's paint that has just a ton of medium in it. And they forget that this is on a spectrum. Oh, I forget that, uh, like, the, the stream is cut off, so you didn't see me do any of that palm frond. Sorry about that. Okay. I was looking at my camera and not the stream. I'm still getting used to this. Okay. And I can't go all the way out here. Okay. Um, the... Many artists forget that Fat Over Lean is actually on a spectrum. And in between there is paint right out of the tube. Actually, paint right out of the tube is a bit closer to, like if you put it on a spectrum, it'd be a bit closer to the, the lean side of paint. So if you start with paint right out of the tube, you're essentially lean. And then if you work up to paint um, with medium in it, your fat, you still follow the fat over lean rule. And that's how I mainly do it. And there's the, the other part of that is many artists want to start out drawing uh, and paint. And when you, when you start out drawing and paint, you want these very thin, long strokes, right? And there, uh, this is where the alkyd mediums come in. So alkyds are fairly new. They've been out for, I don't know how many years. Uh, Gamblin has this wonderful Galkid medium. It's a fluid medium. And I, I've used it. It's actually pretty nice. You thin out your paint with this medium, which is Alkid, which is not considered a fat. It's not a oil. Well, it has some oil in it, I, I believe. Um, but you can use that to thin out your paint and it will dry a lot faster. It's one of those things where I'll have artists that do like a la prima painting. Uh, a la prima is in one sitting, basically. Like you're doing landscapes outside and you finish the landscape within hours and then they're worried about fat over lean. Now, you have to remember, Fat Over Lean is not for these a la prima paint paintings. When you're painting Fat Over Lean, you're not working in layers. Uh, I guess you could, it, but it's near impossible to put one layer of oil paint over another without mixing the two while they're wet. Right. So if you work up a painting all in one sitting, you really don't need to worry about fat over lean. It's all wet. It's all the same paint. It's all mixed together on the canvas at the same time. So think about that spectrum more than anything else. Now, if you still need solvents at the very beginning, if you still feel like, okay, I don't like the way that this works. You know, the paint is too thick out of the, the tube. I really want that fluidity of a solvent. Uh, you can do that, but to, to do it as safe as possible, never have a solvent can open in front of you. I used to do that years and years ago. Uh, and then realized later how unhealthy it was. And believe me, you know, it, look at my non-toxic oil painting video. I have a multitude of individuals that say, yeah, I had to stop uh, with solvents because of all of these ailments. And I have people repeating over and over and over again. I had to stop oil painting because solvents did this or solvents did that. One guy was reporting that um, he had some skin irritation where his hands were cracking open and bleeding from solvents. Another person had, you know, severe respiratory issues and really wanted to get back to oil painting and was really happy that I was able to give them some kind of idea on how to get back to oil painting. 
without solvents. But if you feel like you need solvents, I mean, that's up to you. Um, one of the next videos I have coming out is about finding your balance with solvents. And I would suggest uh, that if you use solvents, you use it very safely. But you always, be, you know, search for alternatives, try different things, experiment. And you may find that you can work it a certain way with how you paint because everybody paints differently. That you can find a balance for yourself that is as super healthy for you and your family. And um, yeah, and you, you make good paintings. I believe the gal kid, I could go pick it up. It's over there, but I'd have to crawl over a bunch of wires right now. It, it has some petroleum distillates in it. It doesn't have uh, a very strong scent, but it does have one. Petroleum distillates are basically some, you know, it's a form of solvent, uh, but in minimal qual quantity. So, I mean, I, I'll show you in this painting and if you look at the past, I don't know, uh, 10 or 15 paintings I've done, I've used no solvents and I'm still looking at them today. Like I can go back to the past 10 years. I mean, I'm looking at a wall behind, you know, behind this canvas of 10 years of painting, which, oh my gosh, I need to sell these things, get them out of here. Um, none of them are cracking off the canvas. None of them are showing any issues whatsoever. The only issues that they show is the wear and tear of me moving them around the room or when we move <laughs> from place to place. The other, you know, here's another thing I will say, and it's a quote that I can't remember who it came from. Maybe it was Richard Schmidt. I'm not sure. Or maybe it was Harley Brown. Harley Brown, uh, I don't know if he's still alive. He did a, a really fun book on, uh, on, um, oh, I'm way down here. You guys can't see me. Uh, he did a fun book on, what do you call it? Boy, my brain just died. Um, pastels, pastel artist. Yeah. All right. Let me move my camera down now. We're moving through this drawing really quickly. This is nice. Okay, I'm on to the legs of a tiger. But uh, his quote was basically, you know, everybody worries so much about the archival quality of their art when they're first starting out, when their first concern should be the garbage man. The point there is the archival thing is something you worry about when you start making paintings that you like and enjoy, right? When you get to that point, then it's like, okay, let me add in some archival stuff to this. But your first, you know, I, I don't know how many paintings, ton of paintings for me. I mean, my first too many paintings, um, you know, I, we're bad. There's no way I'm going to sell those. I need to walk over to my computer and move my reference down now. One second. You know, it's funny on my reference, I realized that I didn't draw that bottom horizontal line. Oh no. <laughs> I have to uh, manually figure out the, you know, where the tiger paws are. I haven't done that before. Not going to be a problem. 
but I think I still need to move my camera down a little bit to get into that. I'm zoomed so far in with my camera and I'm moving so fast through this drawing. But ho hopefully that answered your question, Thinker. Oh, you have another one. So uh, do you linseed oil to increase the fat or uh, for later sessions? No, linseed oil is a bit too fluid for me. I use um, Gamblin's non-toxic gel medium. They have a fluid medium and they have a gel medium, which is nice. I love their gel medium. So that line is going to be right through there. Okay, got it. So this is taking a little bit longer now because I'm trying to figure out, I think I'm in the wrong square. So from here, one, two, three, yeah, I'm supposed to be down here, right there. That line goes right through the knuckles, really, like a tiger. Okay, let's, uh, El Morris's question. Chris, I remember you mentioning in one of your stream that you won some kind of competition in the gallery and you were excited about it. Can you show the painting? Uh, or where we can check it out. Yeah, the painting is called uh, Vulnerability 3. And I won Best in Show at the Graphite Gallery in Edmonds, Washington. It's actually a really big gallery scene there. It's interesting. And um, I have a video that I'm, I'm, I still need to work on. My videos are going to stop for probably a week or so because I'm working on so many other things right now, especially my job is <laughs> kind of taking over my life right now. So you won't see a lot of videos coming out for me. Um, maybe for a week or so. The videos that are coming out right now are ones that I made um, a while ago and I just scheduled them. Okay. I'm going to go back up here to um, so the, the, the painting is called Vulnerability 3, and you can go to my website, chrisbevan.com, go to paintings, and then scroll down. You'll see a series of paintings called Vulnerability, and this is number three. It's uh, the back of a figure. And yeah, I was really surprised, because when I dropped off my work, all the other work that was there was just absolutely fantastic. And, and I thought, you know, there's no way, there's no way I'm going to get anything from this. And boy, was I wrong. Talk about, you know, really validating, you know, winning best in show. The funny part of it is, is, um, uh, you know, I'm going to be telling this story in my video, but I got an email from the person and she said, Hey, you won a, a prize for your painting. It would be wonderful if you came to the opening. And the opening was, it started at like 730 or something like that. And my bedtime because I get up so early, is at five. And I knew that if, if I did that, if, if I went to that opening at that time, that it would just completely kill the rest of my next day. And I just didn't want to do that. 
And I was thinking, you know, it's it's probably like honorable mention or something like that, you know, which is good. But I'm like, I, it's not worth killing my sleep over, right? Um, so I declined. And then I don't check my email often. Uh, it's one of my, you know, lowest leverage tasks. So I don't really check it until I, I feel like I need to. So I didn't look at my email for two days or something like that. And she, she had emailed me back and she's like, Hey, I didn't want to spoil the surprise, but you actually won best in show. And it would mean a lot to us if you were here. And I was like, Oh crap. <laughs> I really need to show up. And it was the day of the show. It was in the morning and I, and I talked to my wife and I'm like, um, can you drive us up there or can we go up there together so you can drive me home? Cause I won't be able to drive home. I, I would be so tired. There's no way I can drive home. So we had a great time. I gave a speech and all that kind of stuff. It was, it was good. It was worth it. All right. Now I need to figure out how to adjust the camera so you can see everything that I'm doing. Well, let me work, work on some of the stripes that you can see within this right leg. Just kind of getting some placement of these very subtle stripes that are here. You know, there's a lot of things on this painting, which honestly, I'm going to kind of wing it. <laughs> I'm not gonna get too deep in the details on it because, um, I'm going back up. For example, the, the palm frond on the bottom right with uh, all of its stuff going on with it. Like, I'll probably draw out a generalization of it and then just work it up in the painting. Because trying to get every little leaf correct on the drawing is is somewhat futile. Because even when you paint, there's going to be, um, you know, you'll have to redraw a bunch of stuff, basically. And that's, you know, this is what, what you do. Because when, when, when I paint this, I'm going to be going outside of the lines all the time, intentionally. And so there's always going to be this need for drawing, this need for uh, not redrawing, but uh, this need for fixing the drawing as you go. You'll never get away from it in painting. As much as I prepare to try and um, move this over just a little bit more as much as I prepare to try and um, remove all the drawing mistakes that I can at the very beginning and put them into a different stage as soon as you put brush to canvas you're going to be drawing all the time Sorry for my halting speech this morning because I, you know I'm 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 moving around so much. I'm I'm completing this drawing so quickly that uh, I'm having to move the camera and everything and make sure that you can see what I'm doing. And I, you know what I, I need to do? I need to make that reference a lot smaller. Okay, there you go. Now we got all that kind of glare over here, which is annoying. Sorry about that.
No, I'm not going to worry too much about it at the moment because there's not much I can do about that. Let's go back up to the palm front. This can be a quick generalization as well. Getting an idea of the major shapes here. What's funny is as, as I look at this iPad, I mean, I got a lot of glare on my iPad as well, but as I, as I look at it, the background just kind of fades away. It's so dark. Could be too dark. I know I constantly get, uh, when we were, when I was working on the digital version, you know, lighten it up. I, mean, I probably will do that with the painting the oil painting. So how many of you on the stream that are here, I can't see a count of people, are doing oil, an oil painting right now, or some kind of painting, maybe acrylic, maybe watercolor, maybe gouache. I love gouache, gouache is really fun. I did that for a while. <clears throat> kind of started and stopped gouache there for a bit. The only paint that I've really not spent a lot of time on, the only type of paint I haven't spent a lot of time on, has been uh, watercolor. I find watercolor to be difficult, really difficult. It's like a, a completely different idea than oil paint. You know, working from uh, light to dark. Always, you know, the paper is white. Don't touch, you know, the white parts of your paper with any paint. I guess, you know, I could probably liken it to kind of glazing and oil paint in some way. Because I've done a lot of glazing. Actually, I, I love glazing. That's what I'm going to be doing a lot of here. The second layer for this uh, tiger is going to be nothing but glazes. Now there's all kinds of just a multitude of stripes that we have. The one thing that I really enjoy is this kind of concave area uh, at the side of the tiger that I make sure that I'm going to make sure that I'm going to grab that, make sure that that is in the painting. Really describes the form. So Ulan, I am drawing with colored pencils at the moment. Next, want to start an oil painting. I am really a beginner. Awesome. That's fantastic. But 
I feel like many times I'm a beginner as well. <laughs> so don't worry about that. All it takes, honestly, is time and effort. Continuous, or not continuous, but every day do a little bit of something. And if you focus on the fundamentals, drawing, form, value, composition, that's really what it is. That's everything. I was just talking with uh, some artist friends on Sunday. We do have like a Sunday online group where we get together. Uh, and he's like, yeah, it's so frustrating. He's like, you know, the more, the deeper you go into this art thing, uh, you always come back to the same thing, that it's just an application of the fundamentals, but on a smaller scale or with a different medium. And drawing is always there. <laughs> If, if you want to improve everything that you do in art, if it's representational, mind you, uh, improve your drawing accuracy. I need to curve that tail a bit more. And the only way to improve your drawing accuracy is just to draw and draw and draw. Uh, you can improve the efficiency of that by looking at different methods, different practices from uh, professional artists. Look, look at artists that you, you admire, see if they have some tutorials or books out, that kind of thing. Um, that you can increase your efficiency by copying them, doing what they do, uh, and then eventually coming up with, you know, the own your own method that you enjoy. Just take some time. And then the next question that uh, I see, I, I don't get this a lot. Uh, I hope at some point I'll get this kind of question, but how long does it take to do X, Y, and Z to be uh, good at oil painting or a great draftsman? And the answer to that is basically it depends. It depends on a couple things. How much uh, time you can give it, you know, on a daily basis uh, is, is number one. Um, your consistency is number two. Consistency is more important than uh, time per day, honestly. I mean, I've, I've built up my entire skill set with uh, 30 minutes a day. Every day. You know, that's my minimum. And just keep working and have fun while you're doing it if you're not having fun you're not doing it right it get rid of this idea that it has to be rigorous and hard the best way to keep a habit going to keep painting to keep doing what what you love what um you want to do and get better at it and want to spend more time at it is if you love it so Focus on that, what you enjoy doing. There comes a time when, you know, if you're, if you're under a teacher and they're pushing you to get outside of your comfort zone, that it becomes hard and difficult. And you maybe want to quit because things aren't working out. Um, recognizing those times as when maybe you've hit this kind of plateau in your art skill and you're about to have a huge increase in your skill level because you are um, challenging your your current state it's uncomfortable right this is all law of, um from a book mastery by george leonard 
uh, the whole idea of plateaus and constant increase of skill through uh, challenging uh, your current comfort level. But for the most part, you know, do what you love. That will keep you doing it. Don't let anybody else tell you, no, you need to do this. No, you need to do that. Do what you love. So Thinker says, have you ever used chromatic black? It's supposed to be a transparent black. I hope to use it to change the value without changing the hue. Um, chromatic black is going to definitely change a hue, I think. Maybe I'm, I'm not understanding what chromatic black is. I thought chromatic black was a black that was made up of a bunch of different colors. I think Gamblin sells it, right? It's kind of like the black that I would create with oil painting. Like I use burnt umber, alizarin permanent, and, um ultramarine blue to create this amazing black and you can adjust it in so many different ways with hue i'll have to look this is the second question maybe you've asked me this once before but no i think it was someone else asked about chromatic black Something to experiment with. Awesome. That's one thing I would say is like, always experiment, you know, try new things. Try a different way of doing things. Try a different type of paint. Don't get stuck in a rut where you do the same thing over and over again. Figure out, you know, that's how you figure out what you really enjoy is you start experimenting and go, yeah, I... I do really like oil painting because I've tried everything else a multitude of times and I keep coming back to oil painting. <laughs> you know, in a very general sense of that. So this palm front on the bottom here, uh, just generalized the whole thing into big shapes. Yeah. Let me see, can you see the pause? I don't know if you can. I don't think you can. Let's go back to the pause now. And I need to fix the focus. Sorry, it's getting kind of dark down here. Let me know if it's too dark, if you guys can't see what I'm doing. This is so strange, dealing with real light, not backlight. Tell you what, um, doing a live stream digitally is so much easier <laughs> than doing it with traditional. Uh, it is a gambling product. I should be getting it delivered today if the delivery truck makes it through the snow. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Maybe they're used to all the snow up there. What? I would have, I need to look at that. What chromatic black actually is. Like the description on for gambling. I've never used it. Um, I have no idea how you would use it or the best way to use it, honestly. So what would be really cool right now is if I could get through all of this drawing on this live stream, my initial drawing stage, and then the next live stream, we're going to be back in digital because <laughs> uh, that's where I'm going to be checking the drawing. That might be a weird one because this is a both traditional and digital kind of function. The way I check my drawing. So you 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 go to digital to check your drawing, get a very objective 
feedback and what is right and what is wrong. And then you go back to your painting and start fixing. All right, you know what? I have all the major elements drawn. They don't look right in a lot of places. I think I may have way too many corrections. I'm going to blame my lack of focus with the live stream. <laughs> not my inability as an artist. No, that's not it at all. It's because you guys are distracting me. <laughs> Yeah, it's, yeah, it's totally my fault. Okay, we can move up. I need to do the trees, at least get an idea of the trees. My core keeps getting in the way. I don't even know if you guys can see the charcoal in this glare. Maybe you can. I'm moving the light around. That's a little bit better. So it adds light to it, but it doesn't glare it out for you. Okay. So right here. And unfortunately, you can't see that on the stream. So let's get that moved over. A little bit more. That's what I need to look into, Thinker, is how can I reduce the uh, lag? Uh, reduce the lag between when I ask a question or when I make a change on the live stream <laughs> and then I actually see it. Uh, I haven't had a chance to look at that, sorry. Actually, this tree is just, it's going to be really easy. It's just a freaking line that goes, you know, straight up. And then it's going to be up to me as the oil painter to, um, yeah, basically do the rest of it. You know, and add in all the texture and things to it. Oh, the one thing I forgot was the, the, the bit of the palm frond that's poking out on the left of the tiger. So that is... Right there. So just to reiterate, this is a Conte of Paris 1710. It's a 3B. I'm painting on a stretched canvas. I did not stretch it myself. Don't stretch your canvas yourself. It's a waste of time. You won't, in, unless you are doing a painting of an odd size and you can't get it, can't purchase it, uh, then obviously you'd have to stretch it yourself, you know, buy the stretchers and all that other kind of stuff. But from my experience, don't waste your time stretching canvases. And honestly, if you're making paintings of very odd sizes, you're going to give yourself a lot of trouble down the road because you, if people buy them, they will look at sizes and they will say, well, I want to frame this, but it's an odd size and I need to go to the frame shop and get a uh, a completely weird size uh, set for it. But if I got, you know, an 18 by 24, a 20 by 30, you know, all of these standard sizes, I could get a standard frame for it and it would cost like a tenth of the price. Well, a third of the price probably. Don't stretch your canvas. Buy a stretch canvas. Work in um, Standard sizes, especially at the beginning. If you're a beginner, don't worry about any of that stuff. Don't make any of your materials. Don't waste the time on it. Uh, I did that too much. I wasted so much time on making materials, creating stuff, being a craftsman rather than an artist.
Okay. Dropped my canvas down. So I'm working on a stretch canvas. Uh, I had, I did a painting on this canvas actually, and I painted over it gray and oil. So it already had oil paint on it. And then I painted over it. Hopefully you can see the top. I'm running out of cord here. Go up just a little bit more as the cord passes right in front of the lens. There you go. Yeah, don't be afraid to paint over the paintings that just aren't working for you. Yeah, don't hang on to it and, and, you know, waste money buying another canvas when you know that painting's not working for you and you learned what you could learn from it. So, uh, paint over it and do something else on it. I'm going to put some idea of this. And actually, no, I'm not going to mess with that in the background. The only thing I will put on here is this twig up top, which I'm not sure if you can see it on the live stream. I think it's cut off at the top. It's a quick thing. Yeah, just a quick idea of where it's at. And I feel like I want to just have some fun with a lot of the strokes up here. A lot of texture. And then the tree, what's left of the tree on the right that we have to do, which is perfectly on the line. That's, that's going to be easy to draw. Okay. I think we're at a, at a point to check our drawing next. And we're five minutes past the my stream time, which is perfect. You know, I have to go a little bit over. Oh, thank you. You paint on gessoed masonite or MDF that I cut to size. That's wonderful. Talk about uh, if you want the best archival thing you can do, uh, paint on that. But let me tell you this, Tinker. You don't have to worry about uh, fat over lean if you paint on masonite. The main reason for fat over lean is it's all about, um, well, no, it's about how fast the under paint, the under layers dry versus the layers over top. And if the layers below, uh, dry too slow, you get cracking on top. So it's all about cracking. But the one thing you don't have to worry about is flexibility of your oil paint at all. Uh, so you can paint thick or thin. You don't have to worry about that because on canvas it moves. <clears throat> but if you paint on a board, like a lot of my paintings were painted on uh, paper. And because it's cheap and flat and uh, was easy to work with. But then I had to uh, put them on pa panels later on, which was a big pain. Uh, my dad made all these panels. Um, after the fact, I was like, man, I should have just painted on nothing but panels themselves. So you can go out and buy these wonderfully cradled panels. They're ex more expensive than canvas, but they're fantastic. Super flat. Um, yeah, I love painting on panels. The only bad part about them is, is how much more expensive they are than, um, than canvas. And just structurally sound. You don't have to worry about bending of the canvas and all that stuff. Is it true that graphite will bleed through? No, that's that's not true. I've, well, maybe it could be. I, you know what? Uh, l let me answer it this way. I have never seen that happen. In my 10 years of painting like this, uh, no graphite has ever came through from my paint layers at all. I would have to do some research on that. Yeah, that would be some a good thing for research on you. But no, I haven't seen that. Um, if you paint really thin, you'll be able to see the graphite underneath. If if your paintings are super famous in the future, right? Um, 
after you've died, they, they will do x-rays of them and then the graphite will show. <laughs> and they can see your underdrawing. Uh, and that's kind of cool. Kind of fun. All right. Actually, I think the charcoal would show as well. Depends on how they x-ray it. You can't see the whole painting. Sorry, I'm not going to back up the camera and all that. Just Or the whole drawing. Um, you'll see it in picture tomorrow. Because what I'm going to do tomorrow on tomorrow's live stream. I will have a photo taken of this exact painting. And it will be a, at an angle. So that the perspective of the painting will be way off. Okay. And we have to fix that perspective. And I'm going to do that in Lightroom. <clears throat> and then we're going to take it into Krita and do an overlay. And we're going to see all of my drawing mistakes and how bad I'm at it drawing this. Um, and it's going to give me a very objective understanding of how to fix my drawing. And we're then after that, we're going to do that on the canvas. We're going to fix all of our drawing mistakes. Uh, and then after that, it's going to be all about painting. A lot of fun. Thank you, you say... Oh, uh, the X Collective. Uh, thank you, you're a wealth of applied knowledge. <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Thinker says, I cut the sides and gesso myself from Masonize. I purchased from the hardware store. You know, that... For small sizes, I mean, that's perfect. You can buy like a 4x8 sheet of Masonite and cut probably, I don't know how many eight by tens out of that thing and then get a big bucket of gesso and you have a ton of paintings just there that are super cheap, ready, you know, panels ready for you to paint on. Great idea. Uh, you can, the MDF board is really nice because it's light uh, or the LDF, that'd be light density fiber board is really nice. <clears throat> um, as long as, yeah, and has a really flat surface and the gesso seals everything. It's easy to do. Fantastic way to paint. Inexpensive. The one thing that you'll find, and you always keep me talking, dude. The one thing that you find is you could go to the art store and buy an eight by 10 sheet of Masonite. And it's like 15 bucks. You go to the hardware store, same little piece of Masonite, a dollar, you know, maybe less. Uh, so always think about, well, could I get this material at the hardware store and would it be of same quality? You know, a lot of things at the hardware store is not going to be archivally sound, but wood with gesso over it is going to be, you know, fantastic. Um, birch panels are another one that you can do. If you get too large in those though, you have to start cradling them because they will warp. And I would not do that yourself. That's my suggestion. If you if you start doing 20 by 30s and 18 by 24s and larger sizes like this, just buy the panels uh, cr already cradled. It's just a pain to do it yourself. Yeah. Okay. That's it for me. I'm going to walk over to my computer and uh, shut it down. But thanks guys for joining me and I will see you tomorrow.